Um, so just as by way of introductions, I'm Andrew Kernahan, I'm ISPA's Public Affairs, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this morning's webinar. Uh, this is the third business model event of the year, uh, and today is focusing on the topic of the evolving infrastructure and retail service provider environment that we're all witnessing. Um, this is a theme that's underpinned most of ISPA's events this year, as we already start to see the changes in the broadband market being felt as FTTP coverage grows to 25% uh, and gigabit capable to more than 50%. Uh, something the Prime Minister recently called levelling up in action. Uh, this, of course, has been delivered by an increasing number of operators uh, from long established names to scores of newer networks. Uh, today, we will hear from a number of the operators and providers who are helping upgrade our infrastructure and connecting to customers to these faster or reliable services. Today's packed agenda consists of two panel discussions and two presentations. Uh, first, we'll hear from experts building FTTP networks across the UK all with slightly different models, uh, as well as a vendor providing the equipment that can power this. The second we'll hear from retail ISPs connecting customers to this increasing choice of networks, uh, and these two panels will be interspersed with presentations from ISPA partners NetGem, uh, looking at the impact of TV services on operators' valuation, uh, and Plume and EPS uh, will be presenting an interactive session on delivering a new generation of digital subscriber experiences. Um, but before we kick off, uh, just a bit of housekeeping, um, I was going to go through the hop in uh, A to Z, but obviously that's not, not needed now. Um, so instead, I'll just ask everyone to be, please be on mute if you're not speaking. Uh, we will take questions um, through the chat and um, open them up for questions uh, part way through different panels and at the end of presentations as well. Um, this event has been recorded and will be available online, uh, but please do send in your questions throughout and we will pick them up at the appropriate moment. Um, so if there are no further uh, introductions, we can move on to uh, the first panel and uh, just by way of a bit of background, uh, which will be familiar, I'm sure, to most people on this call, um, but the, uh, the number of infrastructure operators offering wholesale services uh, has increased massively in recent years. Uh, we are now in a position where there's something like 70 to 80 old nets deploying FTTP networks uh, to get the UK up to 85% by and it's a diverse group. Uh, some are national in scale, some are focused on certain regions, uh, some are vertically integrated, some are purely wholesale, uh, many are open access, but not all. Uh, some are well advanced in their wholesale offering, whereas others are only starting the journey. Um, added to this, there will be opportunities with Project Gigabits and other public funding opportunities that will no doubt have an open access uh, function. Uh, the increased choice and innovation in the market and the emergence of new entrants has brought about real opportunities for service providers and their customers. Um, but as ever with our complex sector, it also throws open issues uh, as we move beyond an environment based around a small set of infrastructure players to one with many. Uh, from complexity of dealing with so many different networks, uh, regulatory changes like new proposed switching rules, uh, controversial pricing incentives, uh, awareness and understanding of fiber broadband, um, interoperability, future consolidation, and much more besides. Um, to discuss these and other issues, I'm very pleased to be joined by a panel of experts helping revolutionize the UK's broadband infrastructure. Um, so I'll turn to each panelist uh, in due course to set out their uh, three minute take on the theme, um, but I'll start by just briefly introducing uh, each panelist. Uh, first up, we have Michael Sandberg, who's a chairman of VX Fiber. Uh, VX5 is a Swedish company deploying open access networks across Europe. Uh, I'm currently doing so in Stoke-on-Trent uh, via an LFM funded project. Uh, we're also joined by Andrew Wilson, uh, head of wholesale and carrier from City Fibre. Um, I'm sure most people know who City Fibre are, but they're building an FTTP network across the UK in more than 60 towns and cities and increasingly partnering uh, with, with ISPs and ISPA members. Uh, we're also joined by Oliver Helm, CEO of Full Fibre. Uh, Full Fibre is a wholesale only alt net, uh, building in small and medium sized towns across various parts of the UK. Um, we're also joined by Radek Ziemba, who is the business director of Fibrain. Uh, Fibrain are a Polish uh, manufacturer uh, in fibre optic technologies. Uh, so, to start with, I would like to ask all speakers to be on camera, which they are truly doing. So, thank you very much. And, and I'll kick off with Michael to set his uh, stall out on, on the theme for the next. So, over to you, Michael. 
Andrew, um, thank you so much for the introdu introduction and ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I think this, this morning event has shown us that um, we are nothing but innovative and resilient when it comes to, to technology and the challenges in general that we're facing. But uh, so thank you for all for your patience and uh, kind introduction, Andrew. Um, I'm Michael Sandberg. I'm the chairman and one of the co-founders of uh, VX Fiber. I've been working with fiber and open access since 2001. Uh, mainly the first years were in Sweden only, but since uh, 2014 we are working outside of Sweden and today we have some 230,000 active subscribers using our systems every day across seven countries. And we're also working with uh, about uh, 80 service providers in these countries. So we have a lot of experience when it comes to how service providers can and, and should embrace open access to their great advantage. And uh, VX Fiber is fundamentally a fiber operator. That means we sit typically between the fiber owner of the passive infrastructure itself and the service provider. And that's part of the European three long or three layer operating model that uh, um, is becoming more and more pre prevalent across uh, Europe and also the world. Um, so we partner with the fiber owners and the ISPs, and we believe that wholesale and open access will only increase in importance. And that's working with the ISP community very closely, and especially the smaller ISPs, the tier, we call them tier twos and tier threes, who have everything to gain and nothing to, to lose, so to speak, uh, the tier ones always come, and in every market that we work with, the tier ones always come when they feel that the volumes are great enough. But initially, it tends to be the smaller service provider. And for that to be successful, we need to make that as easy as possible for the smaller service providers. And we'll talk about that later in this conference. And also, the UK, having worked in so many different countries, UK has its best, uh, specific challenges. And again, we'll probably be touching on those later in this conference. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, now over to Andrew from City Fiber. Oh, I think you're on, you're on mute, Andy. Can you hear me now? Excellent. So yeah, I have to come onto my phone, so apologies because Zoom decided to conveniently crash on my laptop. Um, so yeah, um, thank you for the introduction. My name is Andrew Wilson. I'm Head of Wholesale and Carrier here at City Fibre. Um, my responsibility is to go to market uh, strategy for business. Uh, so I'm focused um, into the business ISP uh, community. As you touched on, we are, we are trading across a large number of ISPs already at City Fibre. Um, and that will obviously continue to grow as, as our build program continues. Um, my background is I've, I've got over 20 years experience in the business wholesale uh, market, uh, both from an IT and the telecoms uh, infrastructure perspective. But I've also the two of the uh, three large uh, carrier providers in the marketplace as well. Um, this subject is um, I'm a bit of a geek on it. I, I love the wholesale channel. I love the, the partner channel. We have a highly complex channel ecosystem in the UK, um, and obviously it's not new. The channel the wholesale channel is not a new thing in the UK. We're building new infrastructure for sure, uh, but we need to um, look at how we, 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 we sort of maximise the opportunity across the channel ecosystem that currently exists today and how can those things shift together uh, in the market. Uh, so I'm really interested in, in that particular part of this uh, debate. Thanks, Andy. We'll come back to that. Um, if I could now ask Oliver to set out his stall for the first first few minutes. Morning, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Oliver Helm. I'm um, excuse me, one of the founders um, and chief executive over at Full Fiber. Um, Full Fiber, as, as I think you mentioned in the introduction, we are 100% wholesale. We have no integrated, you know, no integrated provider within us, um, and we are bringing uh, you know FTP networks to market towns across the UK. We are a national uh, organisation. We're currently deploying about six, seven counties at present, and that's growing. 
And absolutely everything that we do is about providing that best in class service to communities and providing ubiquitous coverage within those communities. Um, and that's really important as wholesale providers, make sure that we are hitting that 100% penetration to make it viable for um, CPs to work with us. Um, and as part of that, we're focusing you know, pretty much all of our energy at the moment on how we support CPs to scale up and leverage the uh, full fiber rollout going across the country at the moment. We all talk continuously about the land grab that network build is in at the moment, um, but equally customer acquisition is in land grab at the moment, absolutely. And this is just such a golden opportunity for CPs of all scales to really change that market dynamic. We are so heavily dominated by a few national CPs at the moment, and we're really starting to see others make inroads into that. Um, and it's these new platforms, these new technologies, the new ways of doing business and the uh, economies, and the, the economics, the commercial around that that I think are really exciting and start to open that up. So we're really focusing on that. We're focusing on how we support CPs to do that and to deliver you know, that excellence that they've got dealing with customers over wholesale networks. Um, yeah. Thank you. And then finally over to uh, Radek from Fitbrain, please. Hi, hello. Uh, thank you, Andrew. So uh, my name is Radoslav Shemba. I'm head of uh, FTTH network department at Fibrain. Uh, Fibrain is a fiber optic cable manufacturer with uh, all factories located in Poland. And through the acquisition of Halne Networks, uh, we also became a router and ONT vendor uh, that help us to basically deliver turnkey solutions to the ISPs. So uh, my main focus is actually to support cable operators, wireless ISPs uh, into successful transformation to FTDH. For the past 11 years, uh, we help over 750 regional ISPs and uh, recently our main focus is to help them also launch wholesale business. Uh, we are doing that with uh, dedicated uh, ONTs and CPs um, and the basically whole ecosystem, including wholesale platform. So uh, I hope I can share some ideas. So thanks. Thanks, Radek. Um, so to kick Speaking up on something that Oliver said, um, the consumer ISP market in particular has long been dominated by a small number of um, high profile ISPs. Um, how are you as wholesale providers helping uh, perhaps some of the, the newer ISPs, the smaller ISPs, um, stand out and compete against uh, such large brands? Maybe Oliver, I'll go back to you on that just to, just to kick off, if I may. Um, yeah, so... I think there's a whole sort of plethora of things around how we do this. Um, it, it comes down to that bit, which is it's, it's the land grab at the moment, right? It's not just, uh, you know, you, you move a customer onto the network now and the chance of churn being lower on a fiber network is significantly lower. Um, so I think there's a number of things that we as a wholesaler uh, and most of the rest of the market are also looking at at the moment. So it's about the, uh, you know, the service that's delivered. How are we first of all making sure that it's a superior quality of the service um, and stability and things are dramatically improved across it that makes broadband into you know, the real utility. Broadband is largely regarded as a utility, but that means it needs to be always on and fiber is one of the real driving mechanisms behind that. So from uh, a, you know, from on the side of that, it's around the better economics. Um, and that's not just the buy price. We need to move the dial away from just competing on a price point. But it's looking at actually what's the long term cost to serve that customer reduction to the CP through using alternative fiber networks. Uh, and a big, big part of that is the right first time. So, uh, you know, the, the friction point for most customers and most CPs and the expensive part is that communication progress uh, process around the installation around fault and all that sort of thing. How are we making sure that those fault, you know, that installation process and everything around the side of it really is a very high level of right first time. But then when things do go wrong, which they inevitably do, how do we really facilitate the CPs to intervene, intervene quickly and have really crystal clear communication? preferably in an automated way. So that's looking at transparency across the network, making sure you can really see end to end of the network connection and perhaps passing that through to the consumer directly. So troubleshooting is quick, it's efficient, and it's a pleasant customer experience. How are we seeing the standard problems that exist on networks today? You know, typically that's around bandwidth and throttling and things like that. How are we making that very transparent? Um, and then how are we making it that CPs of all size can interact and scale in a seamless automated way uh, where communication is just absolutely paramount but i think above all when it comes to helping the cps at the moment um, it's about you know giving the cps the ability to compete against the national marketing budgets 
Um, it's about trying to compete in a world where you know, the talk talks and skies are just dominant. That's what everybody's heard of, you know, PT and people on the side of it. So for us, it's about how we can use you know, our substantial marketing budgets to help educate the consumers on the move to real fibre and to what these alternative CPs in the markets can really offer in terms of that exceptional customer service and all the other real qualities that they have. Um, so a big, big part of what we're looking at at the moment is how we support that budget, how we support them to do the customer acquisition and the customer education early on. Um, and particularly as we see, you know, copper switch off and things coming down the line, we're going to see the national CPs putting significantly more budgets in there. We're going to see CPs moving towards one month contract terms um, and all of these pose challenges for entrance into the market. So for us, it's about supporting on that. And it's not just on the economics. It's on all the other factors around customer acquisition and support funnel as well that bring down that cost of acquisition, that give them that ability to compete with the national C fleet players more easily and more equitably. Um, and that you know, brings that cost of lifetime service down so that ultimately the customer is more profitable for their business model as well. Well, that's very comprehensive. Uh, I'm interested in City Fibre's uh, views on this too, Andy, given that you partner with uh, both some of the national players at the moment, uh, as well as um, some of the, the new upstarts as well. So how do you treat it? Um, it wouldn't surprise me, surprise you guys to say that I echo what Oliver said. I mean, there's a differentiated value proposition piece. Um, for us, it's all around um, exactly what Oliver said. How do we support those CPs building their brands within those regions and those cities? So that, that whole um, city marketing approach um, and um, what we call a city champion model, um, where we're working on a case by case basis for each of these CPs on looking at the, um, the, the verticalization that exists in each city. So from a business perspective, we're looking at what type of businesses can get access to the infrastructure within a city. How do we support them with verticalized marketing approaches? How do we share, share that demographic information? So we've got a lot of MIBI intelligence on not only where our network is going, but also which businesses it's going past and the size of those businesses as well. So we're really sort of creating an environment that makes it easy for CPs to be able to sell um, ultimately their services through to a customer. Um, because the big thing for CPs, is it's all about building their brand. Um, so we're, we're putting them in front of us uh, and we're giving them the marketing support um, and the innovations to help support. I mean, talking about innovations, most of those innovations uh, come from the channel as well. The channel is one of the, the most innovative um, um, environments that I've ever worked in. So we will give them a, a, a vanilla product, but some of the ideas and concepts that the CPs take out to market is staggering, um, and we're fully supportive of that type of approach. Thank you. Uh, and Michael, in your um, introduction, you mentioned the open access nature of the X5, which is slightly different, I think, to, uh, to some of the other um, operators. How do you... Um, yeah, how do you support your, your CPs, your service providers, uh, compared to perhaps to, to Oliver and Andy? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so in addition, so when we have um, conversations with service providers, uh, the first conversation is always around how many premises can I access, where are they, and when can I start marketing? Those are the fundamental questions. Once we pass through those, it is how do I connect to your network? And the third conversation sometime after is what does it cost? It's always in that order. Now, on an active or software-defined open access like we do, we have taken into account that we, we need to address the smaller service providers first. And uh, we see many big investors making the mistake, and I'm using that word carefully, to go for the big service provider first. And that is a mistake. They will um, give uh, you a lot of trouble and they will screw you over uh, at the end of the day. So that's, do not start with the big ones. They will come eventually, no. So what we do, we offer three interfaces, a technical, a commercial, and an operational one. Very, and the commercial are just as important as the technical ones, and, and that's another mistake. So once, once you've physically interconnected, it takes literally hours of, of the onboarding process with us is in a morning. You literally get, you start at nine o'clock and by 12 you're, you're selling. That's how easy it is. And others who are, we're talking to, to others who are providing open access through passive sharing, it can take them six to nine months to introduce uh, on board a service provider. So we take away all the hassle. You don't need any CapEx investment apart from the physical interconnect. And you need very little 
to start selling, to promote the, the smaller service provider who may not have the IT budget and competence uh, to integrate deeply. However, we do offer through a RESTful API access to our system to those who want to integrate. And many of the larger ones do want to integrate. But for the smaller ones, to get started very quickly, very cheaply with virtually no no, uh, no barriers to entry is very important. We have even gone to the extent that we're offering a white label ISP. So for the UK ISP market, there are very many resellers in the UK, which is quite unusual for an advanced country. So we make that easy for them as well to, to get onto the platform and start selling very quickly. And so the ease of onboarding, I think, is uh, the, uh, the difference perhaps that, that we offer. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, OpenReach has 600 CPs plus, I think, on its um, on its books, and, and ISPA itself has 150 members. So, as you say, there's a there's a huge market opportunity out there uh, as things start to start to change. Um, Radek, in, in in Poland, um, what, how does it how does it look there? Is how's the market shaped there compared to the UK? From what you see. Uh, well, first of all, what we see is like the delivery of the high speed uh, to the front door is nothing unique anymore. The service provider has to think how to basically uh, deliver gigabit across the whole house, um, and basically that's the that's a that's a, that's a challenge, uh, especially that basically most of the let's say new PCs or TVs they fully rely on the Wi-Fi. So what we do, we actually try to promote the Easy Mesh as an open standard and basically help to automate um, um, the Wi-Fi setup inside subscriber house. But uh, what is most important is actually mm, we try to explain both uh, service providers and the wholesale is to expose uh, visibility what is happening with the fiber network and with the CP devices at subscriber house because uh, most of the subscribers will actually call to service provider that have limited visibility what is happening in the, inside the network and basically such a fair play um, uh, cooperation is something which is uh, critical to ensure a uh, stable business. And once this service provider um, uh, signed a contract with the, uh, with the subscribers, we actually support them to keep, keep, uh, uh, keep, uh, keep the customer as long as possible. And that can be done with uh, basically a uh, few services that the, that, the, that the operators can sell. Um, and uh, currently, we encourage them to basically um, uh, offer a dedicated service like uh, internet for gamers or, for example, internet from uh, all the elder people uh, with cybersecurity features. So uh, there are several ways that uh, operators can, can distinguish. And I, I, I can say that uh, definitely wholesale is, is a big trend and is booming. So that's the right direction to move. Thank you. Uh, and I think one of the themes mentioned there was price. Um, interested in the panel's thoughts on uh, the recent um, Ofcom announcement um, following OpenReach's Equinox uh, sort of long-term pricing uh, discounts for, for FTTP. Um, I know there's uh, been lots of interest in, in the industry on that, and I'm sure the panel has uh, may have some views on, on where we go next around that and how much it may hinder or otherwise um, Individual uh, individual operators, perhaps I don't know. City Fiber have been very active on this. Andy, anything you wanted to say on it? Um, well, out, out, outside of the fact that um, I think we, we wrote our letters, we we um, objected to um, we put our position forward to Ofcom. Um, it you know in a short story, it's it's anti competitive. Effectively, is our view. Um, I think it does put pressure certainly on some of the smaller infrastructure providers as well. Um, because it creates an environment that squeezes the CPs into um, making it more, it makes it less easy for them to do business. They have to do business ultimately with OpenReach, and and it's uh, forcing them to do so. So we believe that that's something that Ofcom needs to reconsider again and look at is is how it's creating this this anti competitive market with the incumbent using their their uh, dominance in that particular um, in, in the wrong way, if you like. Uh, whereas I think collectively as a community of alternative builders, we're, uh, we're trying to change that landscape. That's exactly what City Fiber was all about when Greg came out and, and said what he was going to do. Um, and, you know, we, we're about giving the channel choice uh, and taking that incumbency and also driving uh, a pace towards the fact that, you know, we're the fifth largest economy in the world and we've got the, you know, bottom, bottom from third worst uh, infrastructure 
Um, so it, it's we know how important this is to the UK. And I think that what we've done is sort of agitated the market to a point where open reach have had to do this and have to react in this way. Um, but I think there's more to come on this. Um, I know that we're working in collaboration with a lot of other fibre providers, maybe smaller ones have come to us and said, we're, we're willing to support you on, uh, on your approach to Ofcom. So that's, that's encouraging as well, I think. Thank you. It's, it's one of those issues where ISPA um, doesn't have a huge amount to say, given the competing nature of our, our membership with views on, on various sides. But Oliver, did you want to come in on um, Ofcom, uh, Ofcom's decisions, uh, decision making at the moment? Yeah, a bit of a pet topic, this one. Um, <laughs> look, I mean, I, I think the first thing to say is fundamentally, um, Ofcom's job is to drive competition in the market for the benefit of the consumer. Um, and fundamentally, Ofcom are failing in that and are not fit for purpose at the present. You know, they grow into this massive behemoth um, and they are not effectively regulated to encourage competition with the market. Um, they have effectively become too big to hold account and to challenge on the decisions they're making. And we're seeing this as a trend of, you know, of everything they're pushing out. And the really important thing is that this affects CPs and consumers, not just us as the network builders. You know, we have a vested interest in sitting here saying we want to, you know, disincentivize open reach, we want to have an advantage against them. But uh, how they've handled Equinox and how it's not in line with SSP that was set down, I think is really important to look at. And it's not just about pricing. We need to move the dial away from just talking about pricing. Pricing is, you know, there's been a downward trend in the pricing market for wholesale. You know, that's not unexpected in here. The dangerous thing is sitting here saying that things like volume thresholds and things like that for you know, somebody with significant market power in the market is an acceptable thing to do. Fundamentally, we uh, and City Fiber and other wholesale operators, certainly pure wholesale operators, are about creating choice and competition for both the consumers and the CPs. And Ofcom is making that job harder to do. It's not making it impossible, but it's making it harder to do. Um, and from a CP's perspective, right, the risk of working with an alternative network imposed by that Equinox threshold is a really important thing to consider because it's a question of who gets there first. So if full fibre has ubiquitous coverage, as we do in you know, a number of towns across the UK, and that's growing fast, and we will have that for a, you know, a period of time before open reach or somebody else overbuilds, and expect that in the long term, that market is sitting there ready to acquire. Um, and CP should be incentivized to do that. They should be incentivized to use the economics of the product, the quality of the product to sell now and to bring that fiber into people and move us towards that copper switch off state. Um, you know, fundamentally what CPs need is long-term stable providers that put a sensible price point into the market. And part of that price point is the long-term viability. I don't think we're not viable on the price point at the moment. It's not just price, it's around the total offerings that are being put into place. Um, so yeah, look, you know, Ofcom is not fit for purpose. And as an industry, we need to be lobbying government, lobbying Ofcom, uh, making it really clear that consumer competition is at risk here um, and that the smaller CP provide just a massively important part of creating those market dynamics and moving us away from you know just a small number of incumbents uh, michael just building on that anything you think ofcom should be doing to encourage um, competition in the uk well i i think the the price structure in, in equinox uh, in, in, a, in a former life, many moves ago, I used to advise incumbents like BT and, and others. And this is precisely what I would advise them to do from an incumbent's point of view. And it is structured to benefit their own service provider, BT. Simple as that, right? That is what is done. Now, moving that aside from, if I take the independent service provider's view on this, I would, this is a headline price, but it hides a number of, of details which are really important. And uh, for those who have worked with, with Open Reach and, and uh, tried to get um, a local loop and bundling, et cetera, will understand how much complication there is. It's not just a headline price. There'll be lines and lines and lines and lines of different additional costs. So if you're a small service provider, you, you find it very difficult to actually create, create a business case. It's not just about this, this headline. There's so many hidden costs in this that you can't actually get a good view what it will cost you at the end of the day. And I think for us as alternatives to provide a very simple costing structure, pricing structure to, to the uh, independent service provider, it is really important to counter that. So those who enter as, as partners on, on our networks, they know a priori beforehand, this is what the, the, the margins are and this is what, what it can give me without having to go through these reams of hidden costs, which are part of the, the open reach um, sort of offer in the market. 
thank you and uh, i would uh, encourage the audience to um to post any questions in, in the chat function too around this or any other issues i suppose on a more positive note um i've got has come up with the, the one touch switching rules that they're, they're looking at um, do you see that as, a, as an opportunity to, to really sort of change the the market for consumers mm. Michael. Thank you. So, so actually, the, the one touch uh, proposition is um, we completely support that. Today, on our system, this is what you literally change service provider with a click, right? That's how simple it is. It's immediate. And the consumers love that. Now, as service providers, you may be worried. You say, oh, but wouldn't that lead to high levels of churn? And the, my, experience now over 20 years, it actually results in lesser churn. Now, this is a paradox for those who are worried about open access and, and these one-click changes. Actually, believe me, it actually reduces churn. Consumers love to have the ability to churn, but they then don't do it. They hate being locked in, and that forces them to look for alternatives when they are poorly served. But uh, typically on open access, we see churn in the range of 6%. Whereas we've seen in competitive um, environments where, where others have single service provider, they're often into the 16 to 20% churn. So it's actually reduced churn significantly. So we, are, we encourage the ability to churn, but our service providers shouldn't be concerned about that unduly. I think you know, early on when people given the opportunity, that may change, but really quickly it will settle down, I would suggest. I often find that people are consumers are probably still a bit too lazy or informed to, to really switch uh, still, uh, despite all the, the measures that are put in place. And obviously there's some new ones coming in. I mean, Oliver, do you, do you see this as a bit of a headache to have to work through or do you see it as a um, actually a positive thing to, to help people to access uh, your services? I think it can only be a positive thing. You know, everything that uh, we're doing here is to provide that competition, to educate consumers, to facilitate them to, uh, to, to move. Um, and right now, changing providers, it's an enormous hassle, right? Even if you're on the OpenReach network it, it, and you're moving within the OpenReach network to a new provider, it's a hassle. It feels quite high risk and therefore it's a big barrier to take up for all operators. Um, and I think by essentially mandating across industry that that, is, you know, that process is simplified for the consumer, it can only be a good thing. And it can only be a good thing for those challenger CPs that are really coming up with the you know, stellar service operating uh, offerings to make it that much easier to, to move and to shift. And it also enables the customers to feel more confident in moving. You know, if you're moving to a slightly less well-known CP at this point, the knowledge that actually it's relatively easy to move again if they can't deliver what they can say on the tin, it provides that comfort. And again, it gives that ability to move now and to discover that actually they are superb. Um, so totally in favor with it. Um, there's a lot of work for the industry to do to get there. Um, and as a wholesaler, if anything, it's slightly easier for us because a lot of the burden sits with CPs. Um, but I think it's a yeah, I think it's a really important step um, to, to to shifting that consumer focus. So it's not all, all bad news from from the regulator at the minute. <laughs> another um, another sort of point that comes up uh, repeatedly is this idea of a common wholesale platform. Um, as, as we all know, there are these competing and, and numerous um, infrastructures, which is great. Uh, it could get confusing for CPs, let alone consumers. Um, do you think there's value in exploring this, this, this platform uh, or is it too much hard work to, to, to take off? Um, who would who like to um, come, come in on that? Michael again. Uh, so, <clears throat> so the important point here is that for a service provider, the addressable universe is the number one issue. So through one interface to be able to address many infrastructures is of great benefit. What happened in Sweden and in South Africa were that there were many alternatives uh, and uh, the service providers were confused. You know, each, each operator had his own interfaces, technical, commercial, and operational. When that consolidated, it opened the market for the service providers. That was a great benefit. So here's a, also a paradox. People are talking about the inevitable consolidation in the UK market. And I would suggest that it will come, but on the service provider and on the operator side, but not necessarily on the passive infrastructure side. Why? Because through a common interface to be able to address many smaller uh, fragmented um, infrastructures, then it doesn't matter as long as you have one interface. So I would support that in general. I think it would be difficult to get everyone to agree, but on the whole, I, I would think as a, as a positive uh, move, to be honest. Who do you think should be responsible for developing such a thing? Because it will need buy-in from a lot of people to, to get off the ground. 
Mm. Now, I think just like uh, in, in traffic sharing, peering, for example, there's a non-profit type of, of approach for the benefit of, of all participants. And I think that sort of general uh, approach could be taken here as well. Maybe something for us to think about. Um, Radek, you have your hand up. Yeah, well, it's uh, the Hosel Passa uh, that it's, it's going to be shared with uh, with all parties. It's it's a great idea, but uh, frankly speaking, that can also um, lead to the situation where uh, the innovation will be uh, slowed down uh, if just one party will con will control it. I think there's uh, a, it's more better option is to create an open standard for for example REST API that every uh, wholesale platform will adopt. And also what we have to take into account is that uh, many of the FTTH deployment that are in, in place in, across the Europe are actually based on the DuPont technology, which has some difficulties on uh, having uh, sh sh common uh, goals and features. And uh, that, that could lead that uh, some of the wholesale uh, providers will be, uh, could not participate in it. So um, that's uh, that's a noble idea, but uh, I think uh, uh, the standards are better than just one service. Sure, Oliver, did you want to come in? Yeah, I think the um, I, I think it's inevitable there will be some sort of aggregation platforms floating around the market. I think it's quite likely that we'll see some of the sort of aggregation focused CPs at the moment intervene in that. And then we talk about there being a lot of resellers in the UK market. There's a lot of people there to facilitate that and they're quite well placed to do the aggregation piece. I think one of the challenges that wholesale platforms you know, quite often focus on the technical challenges of integrations. Actually, CPs often are you know, quite technically competent. There's a big cost to integration, but we can solve that through standards, through TM4 and through something similar. The challenge here is making sure that the commercial structure, and I don't just mean the price, I mean the structure around the side of that is, is applicable. You know, you want to be able to offer a sort of fairly standard product across your addressable market space as a CP. So it's making sure that the SLAs are comparable, you know, the time to installation, the cost of installation, all that sort of standard service offering is fairly consistent across operators. Um, and I think it's going to be a big question really about where these networks are going in the mid term. You know, are we at the moment we see a world where actually wholesale operators are largely having to mimic open reach in their sort of base product straight structure, base price structure, all this sort of stuff, because that's what's expected and that's what people deal with on a national basis already. But as we see it start to see more and more overbuild, we're going to see that innovation come up and the types of offering differentiate. So it will be about the commercial terms, the SLAs and all the stuff around the side of it, standardizing that. So it's a ubiquitous message for consumers and then facilitating the innovation over price, product, all that sort of stuff on the side of it. So I don't think it's that cut and dry. Um, I think that there's, you know, the, the challenge needs to be on that commercial piece rather than on the technical piece in the, in the immediate term to facilitate CPs to access you know, more networks easily. Okay. Um, just conscious of time, we had a question from, uh, from the audience from David Cullen from ITS. Um, actually, it's back to one touch switching. Um, how important does the panel think having a common independent platform is? Uh, I suppose that crosses the last two two questions in a way. Um, any any thoughts on that? The, the only thing I would add to that is, and the bit we haven't talked about is acquisition. So you've got aggregation, you've got a common platform, but you've also got um, uh, acquisition and consolidation through acquisition. That, that, across our industry over the last 20, 20 or so years so I, I wouldn't rule that out either in terms of um you know somebody acquiring um you know a meshing together one infrastructure through acquisition if i could just add to that um i would say that the you know it's quite a fragmented market at the moment with a number of providers in it. So without some sort of centralized platform to facilitate the switching process in the middle, it's going to be very different, you know, very difficult to come up with a standard uh, process and implement it across everybody. So I think there is a role for something sitting in the middle. I would personally like to see the ATA, uh, as I believe they are at the moment, really helping to drive that. Um, but I wouldn't want to see that as a single purchase platform. I very much want to see that as a broker to facilitate the switching process. Sure. Um, this was going to be on that OTA working group, I think, so plenty more to, to come with that as the hard work really starts. Um, we had another question, and um, again, conscious of time, it's an issue we, we mentioned, but I think we probably should pick up, and it, it's the C word. Um, can the panel comment on the time frame they envisage the consolidation 
amongst wholesale operations in the UK may be. We've started to hear more about it. Um, and it's starting to happen, of course. So who would like to go go on that? Michael. I'll be slightly controversial, actually. In, in the early days of, of uh, the industry, there, there will be some, some who buys others. But, and we've seen some, some good valuations coming through. But actually, both from, from Sweden and South Africa, we've seen that those who didn't participate in the first wave, they were sorely disappointed when it came to their turn to be bought up. And the prices were, were often very low because uh, those who, who, who were delivering um, uh, thousands a week, thousands a month of, of new, it, it takes more effort to, to actually buy something than to do it yourself. So they were left behind. And, and actually, with, with standard interfaces, both technical, commercial and operational, the, you don't, there's no need to consolidate <coughs> the fixed assets. Let that be. Let that be owners. There will be owners. Real estate owners are coming in. That we say, uh, Councils are coming in. We see utilities coming in investors from outside of the industry coming in and becoming fiber owners with a long-term horizon that don't expect to be bought out, but it becomes part of their real estate portfolio. And they will stay. Now they want, want to be part of this ecosystem. So let's work with a number of different fiber owners, not necessarily consolidating on the passive side, but uh, that's my, my slightly controversial view. I also think it's a it's a timing thing as well because a, a, there's a huge amount of build in progress at the moment. So there's not a lot of fibre actually in the ground. So I don't think that that consolidation can happen until we actually realise some of these build programmes and probably prove some of the business models have been assumed as part of the investment strategies to gain the money to to support those build programmes. So I think. We're probably a fair few years away from that until we've got a more mature fiber infrastructure in the UK. Well, what I will add is is actually that the fiber is a great asset, um, and five uh, G will not happen uh, without the fiber. So if if someone already have a fiber in the ground and he's a wholesale provider, he's actually mm, he 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 will have a stable income for the next couple of years. So. Um, I, I think more than acquisition, uh, what what will uh, what what could happen is actually some um, uh, financial funds will actually invest in those uh, wholesale providers. Then actually, uh, they're gonna be acquired. Yeah, and yeah, the, the, the funding element of this is going to be a big thing, right? You know, we've seen a huge amount of investments into a huge number of alt nets in the UK space. Um, it will come to how quickly those alt nets can scale, because without scale, the risk of overbuild is very real right now at the pace that the larger players are starting to mobilise this against. So I think we will inevitably see a world. I actually think it'll be a slightly shorter time scale. I think in the sort of next 18 months or so, where there are some networks where there is some stranded asset risk, um, and therefore there's consolidation that happens around that. Um, and ultimately... I think we'll end up with a handful of fairly national networks out there, but agreed that's in the longer term, right? You know, these business models have to build a lot to get to the point where it makes sense to be able complement, uh, contemplate an exit, really. Um, so I don't think it's going to be massive imminently, but I don't think it's that far out either. We've had a flurry of questions come in um, on the chat. Um, I'm not sure if we have time to pick them all up, but uh, one is particularly focused on... Um, yeah, not forgetting about wireless and whether um, in, you know, fiber infrastructure is, is, is the only way forward. Any thoughts on uh, your mixed technologies? Uh, well, let me let me take it take, take that question. Actually, uh, the five G or satellite will not be a competition to fiber. First of all, the five G has a limited spectrum, which is licensed, so if the the mobile operator has to pay for it. And uh, what is more, it will take time to build a decent 5G network uh, in the long-term perspective. So with the fiber uh, technology, we already know that we can deliver up to 50G uh, to the subscriber. So definitely uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's something which will uh, overtake the market. Um, what is more, I believe that uh, there is also an ETSE standard that will actually a little bit change the focus and if operators will actually invest into such a platform. It's actually a network performance uh, test, which uh, which basically qualify and help to non-technical subscriber 
to distinguish uh, service from the better operator because uh, nowadays what they can compare is the price and the amount of uh, megabits they will get in the downstream and upstream. But uh, with the ETSI standard uh, with network performance score, what they will get is actually how good their internet service is to uh, get into the, uh, let's say, access to Facebook, uh, Zoom, and other important services. And that will actually help to distinguish uh, fiber from all the other services, because we know that the fiber is actually uh, ultimate medium uh, and can guarantee high upload. So um, I will not be afraid with, with other technology, that for sure. Thank you. Michael, did you want to come in on that as well? Yeah, the fiber to the Home Council did a study recently and showed that between 60 and 85% of the cost of the 5G network is the fiber. And there will be no 5G without fiber, that's for sure. And looking back over 30 years, we look at terrestrial radio typically sits around 10% of the market when it comes to the primary internet access technology. It co always complements. And in 5G, they have new applications where, where real-time uh, the legacy is so, a uh, latency is the issue. So self-driving cars, etc. So it has applications and has has uh, complementary effects, but it, it will not replace. Uh, there's no no physical or economic way it can. Even though Ericsson, Nokia want to believe, let us believe it is. It, it, I don't believe that at all. Um, Complement, yes. Yeah, you, you just can't provide the same quality of service guarantee over a wireless network that you can over fiber. Um, and actually, except for the very, very, very remote, uh, you know, the cost of getting fibre out there is not that dissimilar to a very robust wireless network, uh, particularly if you're getting 5G and needs the fibre in the first place. So, yeah, there are pockets that are always going to be with uh, wireless, but you know, fibre is very much the gold standard. Good news for us, but which is largely a fixed um, operator association, so uh, pleased to hear. Um, I'm being messaged by my colleagues to, to wrap up because I think we're overrunning partly due to our late late start time, which is obviously our, our bad. So um, I'd just like to say thank you very much to, to the panellists, to Oliver, Andy, Michael and Radek. Um, yeah, hopefully we do this again in the future. We will get more time to, to delve into some of this in, in more detail. Um, but yeah, thanks once again. I think we have to move on to the next part of the agenda. So um, if I could ask you to um, yeah, so turn off the cameras and go on mute and not introduce the next next speaker. So thanks again. Thank you very much. Thank you. So after that whistle stop tour of some of the, uh, the key issues around the wholesale um, aspect, infrastructure, infrastructure aspect, I'm now pleased to welcome um, Shan Eisenberg from NetGem uh, to the stage. Hopefully Shan can- Hello, can, can you hear me okay? Um, can indeed. Um, so for those that don't know, NetGem are a uh, TV as a service uh, platform known for working with many consumer ISPs, uh, including Talk Talks TV partner of choice for FTTP uh, going forward, um, but also work closely with all nets uh, to get the most out of gigabit services through white label TV services and much more. Um, so I'll pass over to Shan to uh, quickly run through uh, some new, uh, new thinking around um, valuation. So Shan, over to you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, can you see my screen that I've Shan? Yes, we can. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Uh, okay, so hi everybody. I'm Shan Eisenberg. Thank you for the intro, Andrew. I'm a Chief Commercial Officer at uh, NetGem UK, uh, meaning that I mainly look after content acquisition and ISP distribution uh, for NetGem TV in the UK and uh, the Republic of Ireland. Uh, so today, this short slot, like Andrew said, and I know, I know we're running late, so it won't be more than 10 minutes. And I wanted to do something a bit different. <clears throat> than the usual uh, and not talk too much about TV or even Wi-Fi or some of our products, but instead uh, almost focus more, almost act as a mirror, hopefully not a black mirror to use the, uh, something from the N word, <laughs> Netflix, uh, and, uh, and to talk about you basically, the, the, the Altnet uh, in, in the UK they, and also the ISPs. Uh, because we have been at the, at the heart of the UK uh, Altnet ecosystem for almost two years now. It was in December 2019 that we announced our first cohort of ISP partners uh, in the UK. And we've seen uh, in those two years uh, Altnet uh, start, grow, some of them stop as well. Uh, and uh, the phrase gold rush comes to mind, came to mind also many times in conversations we've had at Connected Britain a couple of weeks ago. Uh, 
when you say gold rush, in fact, it's there, there is a lot of investment. We know it. I mean, it's been what close to two billion last year, uh, 1.5 the year before, and I think for this year, anticipated to be around the two billion mark again in terms of uh, investment. But that's not the gold, really. Of course, the gold is not investment. It's the return that is coming from this investment. What is going to come to the uh, to, to the shareholders, and uh, and and on this one, I mean, there is. Um, uh, the, the, when discussing at Connected Britain, the picture that we saw was slightly different, a bit less glamorous from the picture that we are seeing uh, uh, that we're seeing here. It's more like a race than a rush, basically. Uh, it is a race uh, from two, two points of view, mainly. It is a race for, from the from the time to market perspective. The speed is important. Uh, Clearly, uh, some uh, elements, some obstacles, you could say, like uh, the overbuild, uh, the O word, I guess, uh, and, uh, and and uh, and delays have been have been affecting the time to market for many alphanets. Uh, delays coming from construction permissions, but also we've heard a lot about recruitment challenges, difficulties to find people to dig in the ground. I mean. Uh, Brexit related partly, uh, but also to find good network planning engineers. Uh, we, we're hearing a, a, a lot about this, meaning that uh, it only makes the, the threat of overbuilt even, even bigger. And this challenge can have direct cash in, in, in implications when uh, when there are some minimum guarantees that are expected from some of the uh, of the wholesale networks. Uh, and some new news like Equinox have only uh, added to this uh, nervosity. Uh, from some investors, uh, especially around some of the the, the, the open access uh, scenarios, basically we see a lot of ISPs or, or players thinking: Do I do wholesale or open access only, or ISP only, or a bit of both? And, and those uh, or, or hybrid models, uh, as it's often the case. Uh, it's also a race in the sense that there are uh, and there will be winners and and, and losers. Um, so what we are seeing, and of course, um, here I don't want to generalize all altnets and, and ISPs that are different, but there are uh, a few uh, common things that we are hearing a lot in the priorities. And as you can imagine, in those two years, we've discussed with dozens and dozens of, 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 of ISPs and had those conversations. And obviously, the, the number one KPI, basically, that keeps coming over and over again is the home space. I'm going to be, you know, I've got 2,000 home space right now, but I'm going to be 150,000 by the end of next year, or 250. Or 100,000. Homes connected is already much more a touchy uh, type of subject. Is it 15%? Is it 20%? Do you count the homes connected on other networks? Probably you could do. Uh, of course, there is the technology cost base. I pass quickly on that. It's not really our area. Uh, and then there is somewhere the ARPU, the product mix, you know, two, three, four different speeds and, and price plans. We hear about that a little bit. Tenure, churn, not really a problem. The product is really good. There won't be any churn issues. So that's that's uh, that's much lower in the priority. And then the, the others are almost never talked about. Acquisition cost, marketing, sales channels mix, sales training, recruitment. Is, it comes often as, a, as an afterthought. And then uh, in, in contrast to this, you have the big telco priority. And, and we know the big telcos as well, because we, I mean, we, most of the NetGem UK office come from Vodafone, Tokto, EE, and, and, uh, and in terms of the, the ISPs we work with, thanks Andrew for mentioning, we, we, are, we have confirmed Tokto recently. And, and those guys, it's not that they don't care or they don't know about te technology or infrastructure, it's obviously they're more mature, and, but they, they have over the years developed enormous expertise in uh, acquisition cost optimization, multi-channel, omni-channel approach, uh, cross-sell, upsell, uh, understanding the revenue generating units, how to how to increase this, and they are particularly uh, strong at uh, marketing bundles. Basically, of course, that's the common point. If you want to come to me, I, I've got like a, a library of hundreds of uh, execution examples of bundles from all of those uh, big ISPs. And what this does, uh, especially uh, with the overbuilt phenomenon, is it uh, deteriorates the business case from the altnet even further. Uh, because through bundles, basically, it is affecting uh, 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 uptake. So directly, you know, the homes connected versus homes past KPI. It is also affecting basically the tenure of some customers. And uh, as a result, uh, what this triggers is a whole series of kind of domino effect. The product mix goes a bit out of the window. You no, know, let's you know, spy, uh, what's the expression? Pile it high, sell it cheap, or something like that. Uh, and and we're seeing already a lot of very very aggressive price points. You know, 150 meg at 20 pounds. Uh, I, can, I can think of a few a few alternates for offering this kind of, of very very competitive services. But therefore, is the actual in line with what has been quote unquote promised to the investors? I'm not sure. And uh, and, and the overall case basically looks uh, 
looks a bit uh, deteriorated. Uh, which, which is why, I mean, we've, we've had this, uh, this year the occasion over the summer to work with uh, the former CEO of BD UK uh, on the model to look at what CV would do uh, on the business case of the Alphas, on the business case of the ISPs, I'm, th I'm speaking about here more than uh, the, the, the whole side of it. Uh, moving away from sales and marketing, because sales and marketing is almost an easy conversation. I mean, clearly, the, the, usually the, the CCOs, the CMOs of the, the, the ISPs we speak with are uh, acquired to the, are, are totally bought into the idea of having TV. They understand that for the similar budget than what they're spending to decorate their vans, they can have access to, you can have access to uh, uh, the Premier League in 4K on BT Sports, the latest movie rentals on uh, available on the movie store, uh, all of Freeview, Freeview Play and, uh, and promotions with Amazon Prime vouchers, which are typically uh, tier one telco territory, allowing you to compete effectively. So they understand all that. Uh, what we looked at more closely is what is the impact on the business case. And there are two kind of, it falls into many two categories. On the left-hand side, the volumes defensive uh, it is protecting your home connected versus home pass trajectory. So in this model, basically, which is uh, with the, 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 the blue line is the, the, what it would be with fiber only. And in red is what it is when you also have fiber and TV bundles available. And there is obviously a widening gap there. Uh, and uh, it, concretely, it means when your sales guys, door-to-door uh, -door agents or telesales are speaking to a, typically a Virgin Media household, knock at the door, you have a, a better product or a similar product for sometimes half the price of what they are paying, especially if they are out of contract, easy conversation. Then the customer says, yes, but what about my TV? You know, obviously a lot of Virgin Media customers are, are, have TV as well from Virgin Media. And then if your answer is, well, you know, smart TV is good or Fire Stick and uh, yeah, it doesn't completely hit the mark. And then the customer goes like, okay, I'll speak to my wife, speak to my husband, not sure. Uh, think about it and, and, and you know, you've missed an opportunity for maybe months to come. But then the, perhaps the almost more interesting bit is on the right, right hand side, which is the, the CLV, the customer lifetime value, the value of each customer of your base. And here there is a compounded effect. Obviously, there is an extra ARPU that is coming from having a bundle with TV. There is also an extra margin. But what is, what's interesting is that there is the, the impact on tenure and churn, which you will see, of course, after maybe not in the first few months. It's clearly not front of mind, but it comes soon enough. And we know uh, from our experience in looking at tier one telcos, but also looking at the, the numbers from our customers, that the churn numbers, the tenure are not the same, whether it's a broadband only, fiber only deal that has been grabbed or whether it is a multiplay. Uh, it goes up to 50% uh, in terms of improvement on tenure. And when you multiply this with the ARPU, it gets, you're getting to a compound, compounded effect, uh, meaning that the, the, the value of each customer goes up by uh, more than 100 pounds per customer when they are a uh, fiber and TV uh, customer. Uh, and that plays a massive role, of course, when, when, if one day you're looking at selling your base or evaluate, evaluating your, your base generally. We believe in our experience that uh, this approach, customer base, basically the value of each customer is, is favored by investor more than the traditional EBITDA multipliers uh, type of metrics. So it makes, a, it makes a big difference. Finally, I will conclude by saying, uh, Andrew, just to see that I'm respecting the, the timings, uh, that uh, we have this in common that we're in a race as well. You guys are in a race, but we are also in a race. Najem TV is in a race to establish ourselves as a, a pay TV platform, a light pay TV platform alongside Sky, Virgin Media, BTT. Uh, I wouldn't go as far as to say that we've finished our race, clearly not. Uh, however, we have passed a few milestones. We believe that our content is complete now. Some of you guys that have, who have spoken with us in the past year or so, we were playing with different bundles of content and so on. And now we have only one, uh, which is 200 channels, 80 channels on top of review, more than 10 free apps not available on Sky and Virgin Media, which plays the pro to, to help with the value proposition, selling at 10 pounds a month. The service is also complete now. Uh, we have a service uh, packs, uh, really well-defined, well-oiled for ISPs, meaning that it doesn't take much of your uh, operation. It doesn't add operational complexity to, to ISPs. We know it's a big concern. Uh, we've introduced, for example, last month, web plugins that allow you to have on your website the list of channels and apps automatic, automatically refreshed so you don't have to look for logos uh, and, and follow every month which channels we've added. And finally, product complete as well. Uh, so we've added Super Wi-Fi. We talked about it earlier this year, uh, which is uh, our Wi-Fi mesh uh, mass market product uh, designed for mass market adoption and, and not to, to, to move away the mesh Wi-Fi from being a premium add-on to something that you can genuinely sell to more than half of your acquisitions and, and uh, upgrades. 
and product complete also from a, from a, from a co-branded framework perspective. So uh, we've, we have uh, now four ISPs that are following uh, this, this co-branded framework, starting with Origin TV, powered by Nagent TV, Community Fiber TV, powered by Nagent TV in January this year, Pure TV in Ireland, powered by Nagent TV, launched over the summer, and we announced last month Talk Talk TV, powered by Nagent TV, uh, coming soon. So there we go. Uh, obviously, the Tok Tok uh, deal has implications in terms of our operating model and roadmap. Uh, the ISPA members still do get preferential conditions, meaning that you have an OPEX line for TV, which is almost ridiculously low. Uh, and for the of the shelf version of the service, I should mention. Uh, and we want to honor that. We still want to partner with the growing alt nets. Uh, we will soon have to focus on Tok Tok to be clear. Uh, but we, we will honor these this, this conditions until the end of the year. So. I look forward to co continuing some of the, the conversations that we are that, that we are having and completing them with as many alternates as possible this year. And I would like to thank uh, ISPA again for the opportunity to speak today. Jan, and thank you for keeping that uh, nice and uh, well, short as well. That's much appreciated given today's agenda. Yes, <laughs> no problem. Um, a couple of questions have come in on the chat, but firstly, I mean, the, the valuation model does sound interesting. Um, is it available to consult um, anywhere? It's full uh, to consult. Not really. Uh, it's full of uh, very confidential information uh, that we uh, that we've gathered because it's not something that we've done as an academic exercise. We've really taken some real case, some coming from publicly listed reports, some coming from our own experience. Uh, so it's quite sensitive. Uh, we uh, we anonymize that anyway, but we can we can share that on a one to one basis with uh, with uh, with ISPs uh, under NDA. Uh, and we are also working on a, a white paper version of it that we will uh, that we will uh, fully publish in the, in the coming weeks. And of course, it, it will be available on, on the ISPA asset uh, library. Well, thank you. And just the questions that have come in, um, one around uh, the slides being circulated, I'm sure that, that can happen. Um, and then just on the uh, column from Fiber Nest, what are the most essential products to bundle to, uh, in a service to upsell? Well, I'm biased, of course. I mean, the, 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 we we believe that the new triple play, though, will be uh, that's the reason why we've moved uh, all of uh, the R and D from Netgem uh, for the last uh, year and a half. And you know, Netgem is historically a technology company, so moving the R and D is, is very meaningful for us. Uh, and and it's uh, we've moved it towards the Wi-Fi mesh product. So clearly, we believe that there is, you know, uh, close to half of the switchers in the market are looking for for fiber and TV. And I won't go back to the Virgin Media example I've used. We believe that it's it's a key component to compete effectively to have TV, compete effectively, but also uh, increase the valuation of your customers. That's the first point. But then we believe there is something in the Wi-Fi mesh. We believe it is a shame that Wi-Fi mesh is very often seen as a reactive thing. You send a couple of repeaters or even Wi-Fi mesh units, uh, or that you upsell for 15 pounds, 20 pounds a month, uh, and then you do 5% uptake. That's not how it should be. Some of our uh, already deployed ISPs uh, are attaching Wi-Fi mesh with every installation they do, because even in small flats, well, maybe not the smallest one, but reasonably small flats, uh, with the, the insulation material use and so on, you guys know that better than me, the, the technical people in the room, uh, Wi-Fi mesh can help most households. It should, it, should be, it should be something offered to the masses and not as a premium add-on. So we believe that the new triple play is fiber, TV, and TV streaming. And, uh, and mesh basically for the for the modern uh, fiber experience. Uh, thank you. I'm conscious of time, so I think we have to, sure, to, no to move on. Um, but thanks, thanks again. You. Um, if you could yeah, stop sharing, we'll um, introduce uh, the next panel, where I will hand over to um, another Andrew, Andrew Glover, the uh, chair of ISPA and MD Air Broadband, who's going to um, chair this panel and also welcome the other panelists to the uh, to the stage, the virtual stage. So. Andrew, hopefully you're there to, uh, to jump in. I think my sound is. I'm just waiting for you to change my video, I think. <clears throat> so hopefully people can probably hear me, but I'm just waiting for um, someone to do the video. someone's doing it if you want to just kick off that might sure okay so um good morning everyone and um we've just managed to slip in in the morning rather than the afternoon um this second panel is focusing much more on the retail isps we've already heard obviously from the wholesale side of things 
So we're, we're likely to cover um, a number of the same issues, but hopefully with a slightly different perspective um, as we look at it from the retail side. And I'm joined on the panel by um, three others, Sarah Hearn from uh, Cuckoo ISB, who are relatively new ISB, um, David Oldit from uh, HiNet up in uh, Scotland, and Mark Wiseman from Connectus, who are a more general um, uh, MSP, um, as well as being an ISP. So we'll follow the same sort of format. I'll get the panellists to introduce themselves in more detail in terms of what they see as a number of the issues that they face as an industry. Uh, and then we'll go on to some questions uh, and perspectives covering, as I say, some of the same topics, um, but hopefully with uh, with maybe different answers, who knows, we'll, we'll see as we progress. So, um, David, could I start with yourself, please? Okay, thanks, Andrew, and uh, good afternoon, nearly everybody. Nearly afternoon. Um, Hynet is uh, uh, primarily a B2B service provider, um, and we've been uh, a switchless reseller since uh, the, the late 90s. Um, built our ISP network um, around about uh, 2011, 2012, and more recently, um, in January of this year, we launched a B2C consumer-facing fibre-to-the-home proposition. Um, so we've entered that uh, piece of the market as well. Our B2B operation is primarily through channel, and our B2C is a pure uh, direct retail play. So hopefully I've got some uh, perspective to, uh, to bring to that uh, discussion today. Um, I think I could perhaps start by saying that uh, one of the most significant changes we're experiencing right now is that infrastructure investment in full fibre is changing the shape of the UK market. Um, and that change is uh, being accelerated by the COVID pandemic and uh, greater adoption of cloud services, not just by business, but their understanding of the cloud um, for the consumer is definitely uh, something that's been very much accelerated uh, through the pandemic. Um, so what from that? Um, well, I think we're in a rare position right now of having supplier push coinciding with consumer pull. And for a retail provider, that really should be the best of all opportunities. Um, but the wholesale landscape is providing products still from a relatively small number of large scale infrastructure providers, um, along with a swathe of smaller builders and operators, uh, mostly in uh, geographical niches. So I think that aligning with the right partners for the full fibre world um, really is going to be vital for the retail player um, because many of the business models and supply chains that were successful in 2019, 2020 um, aren't going to cut it probably by 2025. Um, at Hynet, we've looked closely at this in recent years and the results been that in addition to our direct relationships with infrastructure builders where we have a local presence um, we're also ensuring we have the right wholesale service providers to have all of our bases covered um, in terms of product and geography um, i think another key factor uh, we have to bear in mind is to be realistic about the volume of m i activity that we can expect through this period of transition as the fibre to the home market matures. Um, and whilst nobody buys or sells a business to wreck it, there is every chance that the small and local infrastructure provider that uh, you might buy from as a retail ISP um, could be acquired by a bigger fish that you regard out and out as a competitor. Um, maybe that's nothing new. Maybe that was sort of ever thus um, in the telecoms and, and internet industry in general. But I suspect we're going to see M&A on quite an unprecedented scale over the next five to 10 years. And together, these factors point towards the new switching regulations and processes um, needing to be as good for the supply chain as Ofcom intends them to be for the consumer. And I think a lot of energy and a fair bit of cash is going to be sucked out of most ISPs uh, as we deal with these changes. Um, but the overarching goal of simplifying supplier switching in the full fiber world um, I, I think it has to be a good thing um, as a goal, um, albeit it's one which is painfully tight timescales um, and without many of the necessary building blocks in place yet. Um, finally, to end and hopefully not uh, overgo my uh, three minutes or so, Andrew, 
Um, I, I think the customer demand is very much for better quality of experience, um, including this always on connectivity, but both in business and consumer. Um, and resilient solutions should be much easier to deliver than they used to be. Um, but the ability of the retail service provider to provide genuine resilience will also hinge on the decisions that that provider makes about their wholesale supply chain. So I think very much the ball is in our court and it's up to us to do what we can with it in this rapidly changing landscape. Oh, yeah. Thanks, David. And we'll come back to a number of those uh, those points. Um, Mark, could I turn to you next, please? Thanks, Andrew. Um, still on good morning, everybody. So um, my name is Mark Wiseman. I'm commercial director at Connectus. So we're a managed service provider, as Andrew said. So we provide fiber security, IT kind of infrastructure and support through our Connect, Protect and Collaborate offering. And, and essentially that's helping businesses to mitigate their cost complexity and risk as we, as we help them go through their digital transformation. And I think that's probably the, the key thing really I wanted to talk about today was that if we just kind of flip to the other side and look at it from the customer's eyes in and we think about you know, what's the situation that our customers are going through. Well, I think we've got a couple of things. First thing, in terms of the general environment that we're all living in, we've got, as a business, I kind of think about our suppliers. We've got multiple suppliers for telephony, connectivity, IT, and so on. The line between where those services start and stop is starting to get more fuzzy. So you think about, is my connectivity working? Well, it depends. Is that is it the circuit? Is it the connection? Is it the Wi-Fi? Is it that starting to get a little bit fuzzy, I think. We already see telcos are starting to sell, um, various telcos are starting to sell bits of IT, Microsoft 365. There's a, you know, there is an opportunity to kind of grab a, an additional share of wallets. So we're already, already seeing that. I think as a business, we're all in the situation where certainly a couple of years ago, cyber security was a, you know, it's a dirty conversation. It wasn't something that was easy to get people talking about. But these days, I think everybody's has been touched by it a lot more. People are a lot more open to a cybersecurity question and aware of the threat. So I do think we've got post hope, post post COVID, we've got a, a business community that are they've got to embrace hybrid working. That you know, setting their business up to work from home. A lot of a lot of them have fudged it so far, but need to you know need to have something more commercial in place. There are a number of businesses that are struggling post COVID to so those IT suppliers, those telco providers. So, uh, you know, there are some businesses there that are ripe for acquisition. Um, and there's, a, I think increasingly, businesses want to actually make the most of, of their IT and technology uh, opportunity. So I think they want, you know, from the conversations I see and I have, they, they probably want fewer, better suppliers. They want those suppliers to work with them as a more strategic partnership, because actually I don't, you know, I don't necessarily understand what can be done. So help me understand what can be done and help me to make that happen. Um, I also think there's a there's a people generally want to have a secure business. So I guess the question I, the questions I, I've got in my mind are actually I think that that opportunity for uh, for ISPs to stretch out into the IT space I don't think is necessarily that that bigger one. I think, you know, actually, how do you, the question might be, how do you best do it? Is it by employing skills and abilities is it, or is it by partnering with people or is it by acquiring those IT businesses? I think the other thing is, is actually, if the environment tells us that there's lots of IT small businesses around that potentially are struggling, that could be quite an easy acquisition. I guess the question that we've mentioned a couple of times before is from a customer perspective, I just want that, I want, you know, I want one, as best as possible, I want one supply chain that provides my technology, my connectivity, makes my services work. And so when it doesn't go right and goes wrong, I want to be able to, I want a simple support model that I can call and I don't want fingers pointed. So I think that's the, the key thing is how do we provide the customers the service that they want end to end? Sure. Thank you. Um, and last, last, last but not least, uh, and good afternoon uh, to Sarah. Thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure to join the panel. I'm um, Sarah Hearn, Head of Strategy and Operations at Challenger ISP Cuckoo. Um, I'd like to start by saying that I really enjoyed the first session. I joined Cuckoo from a completely different industry, from tech and marketplace e-commerce. 
So as a recent entrant of the world of telecoms, I think I've joined at a very exciting time. Um, for those of you who don't know Cuckoo yet, uh, we launched last year and we're backed by RTP Global and Jamjar Investments, as well as some of the early investors in Bulb, Monzo and Octopus. We're reseller only, focus only on providing an amazing customer experience through acquisition, billing and then ongoing customer service. And we don't op own or operate any infrastructure or networking. So that will give you a bit of context uh, on the angle I'm coming at the questions today from. Um, we see ourselves as a consumer champion brand and that is very much reflected in our feedback, reviews and the net promoter score that we have. But we're also a technology business at heart. We have an in-house team of developers and they have a background that spans from utilities to other startup companies and platform businesses. I was asked to say a little bit about what we look for in a wholesale partner. I think it's really very straightforward. We're, we're looking at how easy and quickly we can integrate with partners. Um, you know, that comes down to RESTful APIs, documentation, easy standards. We want access to as wide a footprint as possible. We're a national ISP and we need pricing to support uptake of this footprint and be able to go to market with it an attractive proposition. And then finally, we're looking for partners that want to work with us, as Mark touched on, as a strategic partner. Um, and that spans kind of joint approaches to technology, go to markets, business models, as well as progressive growth incentives for challengers like us. Great, thank you, Sarah. And um, just to say that I'll um, chip into the panel, because obviously, um, as well as being ISPA chair, um, I run a broadband, which again is focused now purely on selling um, fiber um, wholesalers uh, and retail to consumers. So um, we work with about seven wholesale partners now. Um, so have a, a great range of, of experience as well on those. And um, first question for the panel really is we've, the big challenge obviously for the wholesalers is to get people onto their networks. Uh, as well as for ourselves to acquire customers. What's people's um, experience? What are the barriers to getting people to switch to fiber um, or the reasons for switching? What are you finding as the, the problems or the successes? Um, Sarah, do you want to sort of carry on on that first? Yeah, sure. We it's, we actually just launched our full fiber offering yesterday. So we've launched with a 115 speed and a one gig on one month rolling. And then we're offering our existing FTTC base um, free upgrades. So I think, you know, for us, our ethos is all around fair, fair broadband for the masses. So we want to be able to offer the fastest speeds at a fair price wherever the connection becomes available. Um, the way we see it, an FTTP connection is really the foundation for the future in home experience. And we had that really interesting conversation just now around TV and the value add from that. But we do know that the consumer understanding is kind of lagging the rollout and uptake is also lagging. So the connections isn't matching the footprint. Um, so I think it is very much about how we talk to our customers about not about the technicalities of it, but about what it's going to enable for them in terms of smart home, in-home entertainment. And also, I think a really important new frontier is the world of working from home. So we're, we're thinking about how we message that and how we um, bundle and package things in a way that supports that. And looking at a lot of interesting partnerships as well across different, different areas that touch smart home, entertainment and working from home. Thank you. And David, from, from your experience, how have you found it? Um, yeah, I, I think I very much uh, e echo those, those comments from uh, Sarah um, regarding um, the education of the customer in particular. Um, and I, I think we, we have still a, a couple of key challenges to overcome there. And uh, one of them is uh, the way that up until now, the market has been very fixated with speed and it's you know how many megabits per second can I get uh, and that's something that the consumer has relied on in their buying decision um, in, in a perhaps in a disproportionate way um, it's just been a case of how fast and how much um, uh, and there hasn't been much of a conversation 
and until more recently, about, well, what can you do with that? Um, and I think, uh, yeah, Sarah is absolutely right that uh, getting that conversation with the customers it is key to encourage that greater uptake. Um, it, it is more about the what it will enable you to do. Um, again, I, I, as I mentioned in my opening comments, I think, I think the pandemic has been a help with that because people who have been forced to work from home, who have had to try and uh, homeschool children, for example, suddenly get a better understanding about uh, why they may need something that's able to power multiple devices um, smoothly um, and concurrently. Um, I, I think there's still also a slight hurdle we have to overcome in terms of the education piece um, about people understanding what uh, full fiber and uh, gigabit capable networks are compared to some of the old legacy copper services um, where unfortunately many people still believe that they have a fiber connection. Um, don't really want to go over old ground about some ASA rulings of the past, but uh, yeah, I think that is still having an impact even now uh, that many people don't understand uh, what the new infrastructure and technology can bring to them and why it's so radically different from the old copper-based services that they may, they may have. Great. And um, Mark, have you got anything to add from a more business perspective? I think it's, um, I think what's really interesting is as, as the bandwidth increases and stops becoming an issue so you know what you can do stops it stops being limited by your bandwidth i think helping businesses in particular we work with business but helping businesses to understand the art of the possible is a is a big task because actually i think unless they are you know very technically competent it's really easy to not know what this is now enabling and as david's just touched on there you know i think i think that's a, a key point is you know do businesses understand what can be done now are they limited they're no longer limited you know, needing help and support in order to take them on that journey is a, is a, is a big opportunity, I think. Sure, thank you. And um, uh, David's sort of asking related to this around the sort of gigatag and obviously um, ISPA's involved in that and a number of organisations uh, involved in that, which is trying to do some of that education piece um, and drive some of that change. But I think it's a, there's a lot more still to do on that education okay. side um into them so that whole narrative um and i think we've got a long way to go obviously the the future when everything switched across it becomes very easy but i think we're in this transition phase um there's a lot more to do um and people may be regretting what um they tried to advertise before okay um the next sort of area I'd like to look at is, is really sort of um, our part in the relationship with um, the wholesalers. And I just wondered if quickly people had um, their sort of top requirements of what you're looking for in a wholesale partner. Um, Who would like to start? Mark, while you're there in, on screen, do you want to? Sure. So I think, you know, I think historically, I don't, in, in a lot of ways, I don't think it's changed. You know, I think in terms of what makes a, a good wholesale partner or supplier, I think there's a number one, I think for me is about being easy to do business with. And that, and that can mean a number of different things. But of course, I think it's that price is important. It's always been important. That's, that's critical, but, you know, being able to engage, you know, being able to get clear and, and easy pricing, having a provisioning and supply chain that works and works simply and, and well as simply and seamless as it can do um, uh, given the environment but uh, then that support infrastructure as well so I think for me the you know obviously price is important but for me that kind of ease of relationship easy to do business with both when you're provisioning and requiring support is is critical okay thank you uh David yeah I think um Part of that easy to do business with piece is um, the, the requirement for automation. And um, if we can't automate uh, processes, uh, and I think it's the same within consumer and business uh, connectivity. If we can't automate those processes and keep our cost to deliver um, as low as it possibly can be, um, we're, we're at a disadvantage. So yeah, um, that, that that's very much a key uh, requirement from our point of view with the wholesale partner um, but also we're wanting 
partners who are engaged with us and have a bit of a vision about where they're going in the future, uh, what technology they're going to bring to market, and why and when and where. Um, and we're not looking for purely transactional relationships where yeah, we, we buy X from product Y and it's stack it high, sell it cheap. Um, we are generally looking for uh, wholesale partners who have a vision of where they're going to be in five or 10 years time. And we want to be there with them because we feel we have a fit. Great, thank you. And Sarah, you, you say you're starting out. Um, what are your criteria for, for finding partners? I touched on a few of the things, so ease of integration, the footprint that we can access, and, and then like the others have said, the strategic relationship. But I think another element that we've been thinking about increasingly recently is that distinction between a wholesale partner who also is a retailer and it has that drive to protect their retail prices on one side. And that, I think, is something uh, we're increasingly looking at other models of partnership where we can work with pure wholesale players or technology layer on top that can provide us um, the pricing that we're really after because the margins are still very high on the on-sell from open reach through to wholesale and uh, much higher than an FTTC, FTTC as you know so I think that's an interesting direction for us to be looking at. Thank you and I think I would endorse um this bit about you know everyone knows that retail ISPs the margins are very small so everything that helps to automate reduce time reduce input uh, and touch points uh, is very key and the other one is uh, I would just add is um, accuracy of data so knowing where the wholesaler is when they're going to get to a particular place so that again we can target that marketing at the right time um, and obviously we all want to be able to deliver prom promises, but when you say that, yes, we can connect you in uh, six weeks time because the build will be finished, we sort of need to know that it's going to happen. Um, otherwise it just causes complication down the line. So accuracy of data of, of builds and knowledge up front as well. So it's not just, oh, you can now go and sell here. It's, we will be there in two months time um, is, uh, is incredibly helpful to be able to build that partnership. Um, do please keep the questions coming on the chat. Uh, we will try and get to them and fold them in as well. Um, so uh, do sort of add those comments. Um, and I will try to keep an eye on that while uh, doing the sort of rest. We've um, had debate already around the whole sort of Equinox and uh, Equinox and open reach pricing and, and incentives. Um, is that something you're looking for from all your partners? Is that something that would sway you to only work with OpenReach? Um, what's, what's people's sort of views on the, the impact that's had? Um, Mark? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question. Um, I don't think it's necessarily something that we would, you know, solely select a, a provider on based on those, you know, based on that. So. You know, I think it's a wider, it's a wider selection criteria. And we've already talked about being easy to do, you know, do business with, you know, automation systems, um, as pricing as well, everything else. So, no, I think you know, from my perspective, it's it wouldn't be enough to kind of pick one supplier. No, I think it's a much, you know, much broader spectrum of criteria that we would use to select providers. Great, thank you. Anyone else got anything to add to that? Um, so a question just coming in as well, um, whether the panel feels that the, um, the long term costs, so he's in that fibre is cheaper to run in the long term, uh, whether that gives an opportunity. Um, David, have you got any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, tr trying to read that question in the chat and sure, uh, yes. I, I, I understand it, yeah. Um, well, I, I think um, if we're not happy with the commercial arrangements we're getting from a wholesale provider, they're, they're not going to be a long-term sustainable partner. Um, so it's down to them to play nice. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, let's have something that works for both of us. Um, I, I think um, there is enough aggressive pricing in the wholesale market at present, and I 
would hope that that will continue um, to provide genuine challenge to open reach. Um, how that will pan out, coming back to the previous question in the face of uh, Equinox, uh, I think perhaps yeah, remains to be seen. But uh, uh, I. I I, I do think that there are the competitive landscape is strong enough and, and the margins can still be made with the right service wrap and product offering. Um, perhaps it's a case that, yeah, that to a degree, it still remains a scale game and the more you can scale as a retail provider, um, the more you're able to manage some of those commercial competitive challenges. Thank you, David. Um, I think the only thing I'd add sort of that is um, that's probably a long term in terms of whether that means that pricing gradually comes down because the networks are easier to operate. Um, I think the short term issue is how do we actually convert people across in the interim before we move to a whole fibre net um, nation. Um, it's the transition of getting there over the next five, seven years, I think, which is going to be interesting. Yeah, if I could then just quickly comment on that and say that our strategy is absolutely clear. We want nobody left on copper for one day longer than necessary. And we're working quite hard to make that happen. Yes, and I think that also adds to one of the barriers we're seeing, which is people, of course, um, the more Ofcom and uh, other people sort of push to make sure people are in contract, is we're seeing lots of people who still got 18 months of a contract to run uh, might want to move, but uh, obviously um, are tied in. So um, that's another barrier. Okay, I'm being sort of asked to uh, to try and wrap up. I know we're sort of short of time, but Sarah, did you want to come back in? I was just going to say that for us as a reseller, one of the difficulties is to get a picture of the full all-in cost um, because we don't do the middle layer networking piece and we really want to integrate with players like uh, City Fiber and KCOM, but it is taking time because um, we're not sure how we're going to do it and they don't have a clear roadmap and um, we're not sure what the investment from us is going, what, what investment is required. So I think more clarity on that and a clear kind of go to market for resellers would be very valuable. Sure, thank you. Uh, and just replied to the question around sort of uh, wireless. Um, we used to be a wireless provider, but uh, I'm not aware of anybody that's wholesaling wireless solutions uh, at present, but um, I'm sure someone might correct me on that. Um, okay, um, I think we're about there. If Andrew, do you want to now uh, take over? Yes, thanks, Andrew, and thank, thanks to the panel. And nice to see your your dog has just come in. The time to finish. Maybe after a walk, so maybe that's a, a fitting time to, to finish. Um, so that's on to the last part of our uh, agenda, which is um, a presentation from two listed partners uh, for the price of one, uh, EPS and Plume, um, who I know have an interactive uh, session lined up uh, around delivering a new generation of digital subscriber experiences. I'm conscious that we have overrun, so we're going to extend the event by another 20 minutes or so uh, to, to include uh, the EPS and Flume guys. My wrap up will be 10 seconds rather than 10 minutes at the end to, to help that as well. So if I could ask um, Barry, Alexander and David to uh, turn on camera and, uh, and, and present, that would be, that'd be great. Thank you. Cheers, Andrew. Um, Thank you. Let me share. Okay, um, yeah, so obviously we've shortened on time, so we'll try and get through the slides as quick as possible and leave as much time for the demo. Um, so this is about EPS Global and Plume's partnership today, delivering a new generation of digital subscriber experience. So I'm Senior Systems Engineer with EPS, and David will be talking after me, is the Director of EMEA Accounts for Plume, and then Alexander will run the demo. So as I said, we'll try and get through the slides as quick as possible so we can leave a bit of time for that right. demo. Okay, so uh, EPS Global, we're 22 years old now. We're uh, the last decade we've worked in open networking. So little, small little background in open networking. Um, about 2009, Facebook decided they wanted to redesign their network. So they designed their own switches, their own operating system, FBOS, their own cooling, um, 
basically the whole data center. And that data center is still running in Primeville, Oregon. But what they did then was open source all their designs. From that, the OCP was created, which is the Open Compute Project. And now that looks after all the hardware, so open networking hardware. It's called disaggregation as well. It's kind of got a few names. So then speed forward to 2016, and the ONF started a project called CORD, which is central office re-architected as a data center, specifically for telecoms, obviously, and then TIP. So most will have heard of TIP, the Telecom Infra Project. So they're working on Open RAN, they're working on, on everything from the master, from residents back to the data center, kind of end-to-end -end solutions. So where we fit in is kind of in the center of that ecosystem. So there's multiple hardware vendors. We have Edge Core Networks, UFI Space, Delta, Celestica, Quanta, and there's more. And then obviously we have heaps of network operating system, NOSs as we call them. You can see some of them there, Pluribus, Sonic, PKA, IPI. So it's our role to kind of sit in the middle and know who's who, who has implementations, whose support is good, whose support is great. Um, and obviously on the hardware and software side, which works together. And then obviously as well, what we do is we install the network operating system onto the box and the licensing and so on, and ship them direct to either data centers or central offices where they're ready to slide into a rack. So it just takes some of the hardship out of open networking. Uh, that's our dots on a map. Um, we've three distribution hubs. We've one in Dublin for UK and EMEA, one in the US for um, obviously the Americas, and one in Shuzhou in China for Asia. Case studies, you can see all these on the website. I know I have to fly through this. Mono Pacifico, uh, multi-city ISP in Chile, and we're working on their backbone. Same with VTS in Burkina Faso, um, working on their backbone, as well as implementing Plume for their subscribers, and then Zeta Connect. So we spoke with Zeta on a previous ISPA webinar um, about improved fiber connections to buildings using 100 gig bare metal uh, with Ocnos from IPI as a software. But we're working on all sorts of stuff in the UK. So we're working on a 400 gig backbone, lots of virtual BNG stuff, aggregation of OLTs, OLTs themselves, there's bare metal OLTs now, um, with radices, um, lots and lots, any type of routing, peering, aggregation core. So there's something for everybody in open network. Uh, so a few trends for CSP bundles. So this is from Q1 2017 through Q3 2020. It's a kind of obvious what's happening. Voice down 6.5 million, video down 4.3, and internet up 9.4. So there's a big move to single play. And we'll see as we go on about Plume and as we explain it, how it's kind of helping to solve some of these issues. Um, operational costs are very high for ISPs, $150 for, for a truck rollout and $750 for a troubleshooting call. And again, we'll see as we get into Plume how it solves those issues. So EPS and Plume's partnership for a seamlessly integrated offering. So EPS looks after the hardware side and Plume obviously provides their smart home software. Um, this slide has changed dramatically since we started talking to Plume. I see over 35 million homes and 240 service providers. Every time I've done this, it's growing by another heap of million and the service provider side grown by a heap as well. So um, pretty impressive for a, for a company of Plume's age. Um, I'll quickly go through this. Uh, reform the bundle around experience. So I actually have three Plume pods in the house and obviously you get the flawless connectivity, very easy to set up. Cyber protection is really good, but that always works in the background. The home awareness stuff, which we'll show in the demo is brilliant. Motion sensors in the house showing movement. But the part that myself and my wife have been really impressed with is the parental control side. So my kids are six and seven, so starting to use um, tablets and so on. And the control we have of that is absolutely brilliant. And even to see what they can't look at and seeing what they're looking at. So that'll all go into the demo anyway. So how can EPS help you? So obviously there's a global chip shortage. And when we started working with Plume, we were getting lead times of between 52 and 104 weeks for the hardware side. So the hardware has to be OpenSync compatible. OpenSync is open source software that allows basically the CPE devices to speak to the cloud. So speak to your app. Um, so we're working with SIG, Sagemcom, Kaon, Edgecore, and all the other CPE um, vendors. And we have stock now of Superpods, 
AC and AX, the Wi-Fi 5 and 6, and Plume routers as well in stock in Dublin. Um, so I'll leave it there and hand it over to you, David. Thanks, Barry. Okay. Okay, thanks, Barry. Yeah, so I'll uh, quickly whiz through these slides. In, in terms of time, I think we really want to spend as much time as we can on the demo. But what I'll introduce today, for those of you not aware of where the plume solution sits and you know basically underlining the story today about improving and enhancing digital um, subscriber experiences and fundamentally that's what's at the heart of what plume does um, with its uh, ai powered uh, plume cloud so underlining some of the points that barry brought up earlier you know we are very very well established um, you know in some of the largest csps globally um, you know with footprints of millions of subscribers but I think one of the most, I think, interesting uh, statistics that, that we've started pushing out recently is that we're actually got in excess now. I mean, again, you know, this is uh, probably a few weeks old now, in excess of 1.2 billion devices physically attached to our network endpoint. So in terms of scale and reach, the, the Plume Cloud really is uh, an amazing piece of technology and engineering. And I think, you know, for any CSPs looking to deploy uh, a cloud-based uh, solution, you know, we can give uh, some really excellent reference points in terms of, of scale and size and reliability uh, in, those, in those deployments. So in terms of looking at why you would like to deploy this, I mean, fundamentally, you know, we've got some really interesting uh, customer statistics, but, you know, fundamentally, um, I'll call out three here that, that I like to talk about with, uh, with ISPs, CSPs, is uh, the ability to increase uh, avenue rev revenue per user, you know, by adding on a, uh, an enhanced Wi-Fi experience solution. You know, we're seeing uh, you know, in, in, in some areas, you know, $15 plus in terms of incre incremental revenue. Um, net promoter score, I think most ISPs will use that as a fundamental uh, KPI metric as part of their uh, day-to-day -day running of the business. And again, you know, we've got some really good statistics that show we can have an NPS in, uh, uptick of over 60 points. And again, underlining one of Barry's points, you know, we're all as an ISP, CSP community or a vendor supplying to those looking to reduce or cut down the time for support calls. And by deploying the Plume Fat platform, we've seen um, declines in terms of support, uh, support calls by up to 51%. So the opportunity, you know, why and, and how is Plume um, succeeding in the current market? And, you know, again, you know, I'd, I'd underline some of the other comments I've heard in the other panels. You know, the pandemic has certainly helped our business because people working from home want the Wi-Fi to work, want a great experience. And, and Plume can certainly help deliver that. So in terms of kind of four key tenants of the of the of the Plume solution, you know, future proof, you know, we've we're scalable, we're in the cloud, um, we innovate, and you know, we mentioned op 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 OpenSync earlier, you know, we're able to roll out on multiple different CPE devices as well as our own. Um, we give a superior uh, self-aware uh, network within the home. So we're also able to give the parental control and security um, elements that are, uh, are developed in there. And as I said, you know, in terms of a, a cloud-based technology, you know, we can grow and scale with our customers and with our subscriber base. Um, and, and this really is fundamental in terms of the, the trend in, in the marketplace from traditional basic uh, Wi-Fi connectivity with pretty dumb Wi-Fi um, and simple to use apps to a very, very um, user-friendly but uh, comprehensive user suite of, of, uh, of, of applications that sit within our work pass and home pass solutions. So before I hand over to um, uh, Alexander, I'll just quickly highlight that, you know, at the core of what we offer is the Plume Cloud and the OpenSync uh, software running on the CPE. And we have two... Uh, products that run within the uh, home or the small business. So home pass for running in the in the in the, in the subscriber end uh, of the of the home and work pass in the small business owner. 
And then we have tools which are fundamental to what we offer uh, in terms of Haystack uh, and Harvest, which are the ISP tools that would sit within your call center. So I'll leave it there. It will be really nice as, as ever. You know, we'd love to partner with ISPs across the UK. Um, I will hand over to um, Alexander now to give a full in-depth demonstration. Yeah, thank, thanks, thanks Alexander. David. Thank you. Let me share the screen. So, I, I will just go through the demo for both applications. So just for HomePass, this is for home users. And on the right side of my screen, you have application which is meant for end users. So really end users at homes. And you can see it's pretty simple and, uh, and it's pretty uh, simple to use and explanatory. So you get a lot of information and the same thing you can see as a service provider. So I will try to kind of go only through the service provider part of the uh, backend tool. So frontline we call it, which is basically the same, but it uh, give, give you, gives you more information. So as an agent who is sitting somewhere in the connect center and accepting a call from the end user, you would like to see who is calling, what what it was done in their uh, environment, how the network looks like, so for network status and performances. So you get all these bubbles you see here, giving you some information what is happening with the current uh, installation. So I'm showing you my own installation at home and you see one red bubble, it's saying that I have chronic problems with some devices with connectivity to, to, the, uh, to the wireless network. And our solution is not just about wireless and the network connectivity, but is also partnering with different uh, clouds like Akamai for security, Sense, is for um, cognitive is for sense of motion sensing. I will try to explain that really quickly, but let's stay here because from this this side you can get a lot of information for an agent who is troubleshooting something. So in this case, you could read which devices are not good, and then you can go immediately to the topology and see how these devices are connected. So um, you can use some of the uh, overlays and when you do a band warning you get yeah the device maybe is capable of going to uh, on 5 gigahertz but it's staying on 2.4 because our optimizer is trying to find out the best way that the device is going to work and the best experience for that device so the application which is used and you see this is in real time so uh, some of the movement in, in, in the network you will see and even with the time machine, for instance, someone is calling you and says, yeah, I had a problem with wireless uh, yesterday. You can easily go on that one and load data. So we don't have enough time, but we, you can load the data and you get the, the, the data that was yester valid yesterday and you can start troubleshooting. So a lot of things you can get out of the topology. For instance, you, you see that I have two nodes they are connected with UTP cable directly to a CP device. I call this over the top. So I'm using PlumePods just for uh, over the top co connectivity, just for wireless and security, but for routing and all these things, I have existing CS, um, CP from, from my local service provider. But you could use one of those also to be a router, so to be a uh, CPE device. So it depends how you would like to do and what kind of connectivity things you have we could use one of those also like a cp device and uh, from the perspective of of pods you get all the information about the pod the nodes that are uh, are there for for connectivity so what are the capabilities what are the channel congestions what devices are connected at and in what kind of state they are so, and the same thing we are doing for the devices. So for the devices, we are profiling them. So that's another third party integration with Fingerprint Bank. So we try to get the information what the device is because the optimizer will use that and try to kind of 
uh, optimize the network for that particular device so that the quality of experience is going to be the best for that de particular device and you see that we get sorry for clicking that so you see some of the history this is high, still pretty high level of information but if you would like to get more information of the qoe we are measuring that on nodes and devices but we are measured that only on wireless connected devices not on wired because we assume that wired devices are pre pretty uh, uh, they, they are okay and reliable so if you go on the devices you will see what kind of data we are getting and the only real data that an agent needs is weighted QS score because weighted QS score is is calculation between all these data that we are collecting for that particular device and we are trying to get the score to an agent what is the the, the quality of of uh, connectivity or experience for that particular device and it's similar to um, a most score so going from zero to five and everything above three and a half is really good and we are also enabling a live mode so you can even get to uh, to a mode where you have real-time information so you get real-time information how the device is behaving on a network and this is from the networking perspective then we have guard which is security as i said we are using akamai and we are exposing some of the things to service providers so uh, we can apply policies per network per device also per user uh, which can be created in the application uh, from the uh, um, end customer and you can as an isp you can help them um, configure those things because usually those uh, people are not technical enough so they don't understand most of the things but yeah you can do that, that remotely you don't need to send anyone to to that person and you can help them uh, configure and you can whitelist blacklist so we do a lot of things like advanced iot protection so for iot devices we measure what is the normal traffic and what are the anomalies and if the anomaly comes we can notify the the user and also block that tra traffic so we are using a lot of techniques for for security the the, th the fourth one as i mentioned before cognitive is for sense of motion sensing when 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 is good to have motion sensing like when everyone left the, the the network and you would like to see if someone is passing your network you can use not just nodes but stationary devices and when someone is passing your network uh, his body is kind of interfered so we know that something is happening and you can even give places where the stationary devices are so you know where something happened and you send a notification this is some kind of uh, uh, physical security add-on to a physical security not just this one but all the the measure that you have for physical security so you can use sense for that and the fifth integration is with ukla service so we are measuring connectivity from the household to towards the service provider so we are measuring those things uh, six times per day and we can measure them from all the nodes that are installed by default we are doing just on one but you can enable that and even the, the end customer can do that so you can see that the speed check uh, the checks of speed is also available at the application and tier two tier three agents who are more uh technical savvy they can configure a lot of things like dhcp also enable dhcp version 6 so a lot of things can be done in configuration so um this is kind of a high level of a frontline tool if you have any questions i'm open for them Andrew, any questions in the in the in the chat? Um, not that I can see, but that was, that was very helpful, and I think in a way it's touched upon um, one of the big things for the day, which is uh, came up through the through the questions throughout is around uh, reliability and 
um, the, the fact that most people's uh, customer services teams are getting complaints or queries about Wi-Fi and um, how they can help improve it. And I'm sure this goes a long way to be able to manage the user experience. So um, it, very interesting presentation. Thank you for uh, thank you for, for running through that. Yeah. Um, I'll leave it open for another minute or two for any, any final questions that might come in. Wise, I think we may have run out of time with our um, slightly late start earlier on. So um, thank you for, for the presentation. Um, and I know that um, several ISMA members uh, this year have signed up with Plume um, and I'm sure more will continue to do so. It's interesting to, interesting to see. Uh, share some of these slides with, uh, as a follow-up, I'll be in touch on that as well. Thank you. Um, so that just really calls upon me to um, wrap up for today and uh, to thank all our speakers um, and to thank our partners for making this happen and also to thank you for bearing with us at the start. Um, this is the last um, online event we'll be running this year. Um, our next event is the ISPA Awards taking place uh, two weeks tomorrow. I um, hope to see as many of you as possible there. We're almost at capacity, so it should be a really good event and getting the sense that people are keen to get back and meet people in person, uh, as are we. Um, as for next year's event program, we'll be uh, finalising details now. Would welcome um, thoughts and comments from members, um, which we'll put into a follow-up email. Um, but the next uh, business model or market-focused event will be in person in the spring of next year. Um, so do look out for further information on that. Um, if there are no final questions or comments, I'd like to thank you all again and uh, see you all soon. So thank you.